preaching and uh, Sydney able to play the piano. Appreciate Brother Josh taking care of our leading the singing through all this. And then our sound guys, uh, they rotate around, but I definitely appreciate Brother Jared, Brother David, Brother Dallas, and Brother Jonah. And uh, so thank God for that. Amen. We're in Ecclesiastes tonight, Ecclesiastes chapter number 10, as we work our th way through this book. And uh, I hope that the Lord is able to help you as he has me through it. It's a book that can be hard to understand and um, can be hard to understand, but it's a book when you understand it. It just gives a lot of insights and a lot of help, and I thank God for helping me as, as we've worked our way through this book. Uh, we finished last week in chapter number 10 and verse number 15 and uh, looked at the thought from chapter 9, 11 through chapter 10, verse 15 on the only way to, to go about how to handle life. And thank God for his help in that. And now we're in chapter 10 and verse number 16. We're just going to read two verses because as I've done, we're just going to work through the verses one by one. As a matter of fact, let's just go ahead and read to verse number 20 and, uh, and it's verse 16 to verse 20. And then we'll work our way through chapter 11 when I get to that tonight. Chapter 10 and verse 16, the Bible said, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength, and not for drunkenness. By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Curse not the king, no not in thy fault, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. We're... Um, looking, as I said, as we work our way through, and what really Solomon is telling us in the book of Ecclesiastes, he's looked over all the philosophies of the world, and he's pointing out some things that, and he pointed out some things that will not work in life. And now as we end the book, he offers some alternatives to these erroneous approaches when we started the book, he talked about all his vanity and, and there's no hope and all these things that he mentioned. And he said all of that is looking at it under the sun. All of that's viewing that through natural eyes and not through God's eyes. But in chapter 3, he gives us the whole purpose of this book. He said that God, there's good times and bad. There's a time to laugh. There's a time to cry. There's a time to mourn. There's a time to dance. There's a time for war. There's a time for peace. But then he said that everything has a purpose and that God has made everything beautiful. And then he spent chapters giving arguments as to why people would say that's not so. The unjustness in the world, unfairness in governments, even homes that seem to be okay. And he said in spite of all that, if you're trusting in any of that instead of God, it's not going to work. And then he showed us how sometimes things that look good are not as good as they really look and things that are bad are not as bad as they seem because good can come out of them and then like I said we looked last week or we looked at there being no answer the week before and then last week we looked at uh, the, the chapter number 9 through chapter number 10 and the only way to go tonight I want to look at this thought how then should we live how then should we live and at verse six, uh, chapter 10, verse 16, he starts giving us three suggestions that takes us to the end of chapter 11 about how we should live. First of all, in verses 16 to verse number 20, he cautions us about our attitude towards leadership. Our attitude towards leadership. And look at verses 16 and 17. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Now this is not the first time that Solomon 
in this book has talked about the relationship of a citizen to government. He's already taken note of the relationship of a believer, of a wise man to the Word of God, and how that has to do with government. And it's clear, he said, that government is part of God's plan for life, whether we like it all, understand it all, or not. And, and in this time, I think that's very important. King Solomon is wise enough to understand that all, not, not all government is good. In fact, some are, uh, governments are hard to live with, and, and under and others are just down and out evil. They are headed by people who are either incompetent, impulsive, simple-minded, vain, insecure, or untrustworthy and weak in their lives. And you and I have had enough experience with politicians in our own country to know that that's true. All we have to do is look around the world to find further evidence. Some governments do not have the kind of leadership that's needed to make wise decisions and honor God. You say, well, that gives me the right to criticize and rebel. No, it don't. Several phases, uh, phrases Solomon used to illustrate this point that government's not always good. Notice in verse 16, he said, princes feast in the morning, eat in the morning. And that word eat there means feast. In the Hebrew culture, mourning for a prince and a king was supposed to be given to judging the needs and the problems of the people. Late afternoon and evening was the time for revelry, feasting, and other things. But here were men in leadership, Solomon said, who indulged themselves all through the day. They neglected their duties to govern. Surely nothing like that would happen in our democracy. Amen? Surely none of our leaders would ever do anything like that. And I say that very tongue-in-cheek because we see a lot of our politicians that do that. On the other hand, in verse 17, Solomon acknowledges the blessing of good leadership. He said in verse 17, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is a son of nobles, thy prince is eaten due season for strength and not for drunkenness. And so here's a leader that's exercising self-control. He's not a child who lacks discipline. He's the son of nobles. He's not driven by moods. He's not driven by impulses. He surrounds himself with people and princes that understand their responsibilities. They are people that take care of their duties, that feast at the proper time, that only to gain strength, not merely to get drunk. What's his point in telling us these things? Keep in mind, he's giving us counsel on how we ought to live. He gives us two scenarios as citizens, one with good leadership and one with bad. And then he tells us how to use and employ God-given wisdom and how you and I are to react to that. What should we do? How should we react whether we agree with our government what they're doing or don't agree? Whether we agree with their policies on quarantine or staying home or not agree? How do we react? I believe this is very pertinent for where we're at today. He gives two proverbs to answer that question and guide us. Look at verse number 18. By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of hands the house droppeth through. In other words, if the roof leaks, it needs attention. Some, rather than fixing the roof, will just take a bucket to catch the water. And Solomon is comparing the nation to a house with a leaking roof. And the application is that wise people, if you remember we looked at wisdom, wise people work hard and they're not lazy no matter who the leader is, no matter what the government's offering, no matter what the government is like, without that foundation of hard work and readiness, hey, listen, the roof falls in, the house leaks, and in a larger scale, when that happens, the nation is insecure and weak. Listen to me. Our hope and help does not come from the government. It's a Republican or a Democrat in there. Our help comes from God. And God said that if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. And we live in a day, especially right now, everybody's looking for a handout. Now, I appreciate the free money that Trump gave us. I'm going to tell you something. Hey, listen, work will start back. And what he's saying is a nation is no stronger than the people that will work in that nation. A family is no stronger than a husband, a wife, or the older kids that say, I need to work and provide for myself. Otherwise, the house starts decaying. That's what he's talking about. The second proverb continues the same thought in verse 19. A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Now, don't misread that. He's not saying that money is the cure to everything as much as what he's saying is if you'll work, 
then you will have the money you need to enjoy life at your level. All the legitimate, normal, proper joys of life, like eating and refreshing ourselves, require money. And that money should not come from the government. It ought to come from, from hard and profitable work. That's what he's trying to tell us. The way to enjoy the normal pleasures of life, as well as the way to, uh, to keep a nation strong and healthy, is for its people to be willing to work and, to not, and not to have money and things handed out to them at the expense of those that do work. If someone is poor, if someone is disabled, if someone has a legitimate need, then I think the government is there to help. But we live in a society that says, you do it all and give me what you do. We have a political system in our day, many that are running for president, uh, that ran for president on the Democratic side, that said, we want all you rich people and people that work hard to pay for all the people that want to sit at the house. That is not God's way. That's never been God's way. And that ought to not be a Christian's way. Hey, listen, God expects you and I to work. And God says, if we will work and labor, we will have the money to do what we need to do. You may not be able to do what someone else does, but you'll have everything. Everything you need to live in this world. And he says that's how we ought to live our life. Work hard, do right, pray, stay right with God, earn money, and then do use that to take care of our family. Amen? Amen. And so then he closes this section in verse 20 with a warning. And I told you there's a caution about how we handle our government. Look at verse 20. Curse not the king, no, not in thy fault, he said, don't even think bad. And curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. What is he saying, preacher? I believe that's probably the origin of the old saying, a little bird told me so. And Solomon's warning to us is, do not complain about the government, even in your bedchamber, even in your innermost part of your house, even in your thoughts. And I don't think his primary concern is that the complaints will get back to the king and he'll be angry or get back to the government and punish you. I think instead he is more concerned about the, uh, us having an attitude of constantly complaining about problems in government which creates a, a condition of dissatisfaction and distrust of government. And America, and especially American Christians, need to hear this warning right now. I have not seen nothing wicked on Facebook, and I'm thankful for that. But I've seen a whole lot of stupid stuff that's come out of the mouth of preachers and Christians and churches. And this idea that this whole virus is a hoax and a lie, and that people, the, the government's just trying to take all of our liberties. I'm going to tell you something. God said, don't even complain about the government in your bedchamber, much less on Facebook, much less on YouTube, much less on any other social media. God said, respect and honor them. And I see a lot of Christians, a lot of preachers, talking about our Second Amendment rights. Look up here. I got something a lot better than a Constitution. I've got a Bible. And God said that I'm to honor and I'm to respect those in authority. And parents, you wonder why your kids don't respect you. You wonder to why people don't respect you when you criticize and complain those that are over you you are disobeying the word of God this government our governor in Virginia he has gone extreme in some areas that. But we have no right to criticize or complain about what he's doing. He's our governor. Preacher, he is a he is not what we are. I understand that. I said I'm to pray for him. And if he does wrong, he'll answer to God. It's not my place to criticize and complain. And when we do that, all we do is get a spirit of bitterness and anger and distrust. And if you look all across the internet right now, it's full of Christians. They're taking our religious liberty. We're never going to be able to meet, to meet again. Hogwash. Now, if I'm wrong in what I'm saying, I'll stand here and admit I was wrong. But I'm going to tell you something. God said we ought to be careful and I'm telling you, we have got a spirit of rebellion and unsubmission throughout America. And it's caused by a lot of preachers and Christians that want to do it their way and talk about their constitutional rights. Sir, what about your Bible right to submit to authority? That trumps the Constitution. Amen. 
I didn't mean to get off on that, but I'm there, and you can like it or not like it. Amen? Still right. And so, uh, listen, I don't remember reading anywhere in Scripture that God's plan for government to be remedied, even bad government, is by His people griping and complaining about it. Amen? There is something destructive and, 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 and about complaining and griping all the time about what good or bad government does or does not do. And Solomon's counsel is if you want to be wise. Now, if you want to be foolish, help yourself. But if you want to be wise, and in view of all that God provides in life and revealed in this book, then we ought to be careful and we ought to live supportively of the government. So first, Solomon counsels us to live cautiously and to live carefully. But may I say, secondly, uh, notice in chapter 11, he tells that we ought to live by casting. We ought to live by casting. Look in chapter 11 and verse number 1. I know my statements that I just made will not make me a popular person with even a lot of my preacher friends. I've seen what they've posted, and yes, I'm preaching to you too. Amen. Chapter 11, verse 1. Not only is there a carefulness and a cautionness, caution, but there is a casting. Look at verse 11. Chapter 11, verse 1, sorry. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, he, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, that word spirit there is wind. That's not the Holy Spirit or even our spirit, that's wind. Nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In the morning sow thy seed, in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. Preacher, what is he saying? He's talking to us about casting. And notice what he said. Cast thy bread upon the waters. Now notice some things with me. I don't know that I'll get to verse 7 through 10 tonight. I'll probably get to verse 6 and we'll finish this uh, we'll finish this message as far as how we ought to live and the third point uh, next Wednesday, Lord willing. But notice this casting of bread. You know, as I was looking at that, I thought about the characteristics of bread. The characteristics of bread. Bread is important, amen? Uh, in my house, it's very important. I don't know that we have a day go by that several kids do not eat sandwiches, do not make toast, or do not do something with bread. Bread and Nutella are like water in my house. They are essential for my children. And, and notice there's a demand for bread. It's a necessity that people have it. Not only is there a demand, but there's a delight in bread. Uh, people enjoy bread. It's something that brings pleasure. And Hebrew said that uh, without faith, it's impossible to please him. And I'm not trying to give three messages back to back on faith, but it's just where we fail. But that's what he's talking about. Cast thy bread upon the waters. Now, preacher, what does he mean, cast thy bread upon the waters? Well, we're going to get to that in just a moment. There's a demand for bread. There's a delight in bread. But there's a duty for bread. People will work all day just to be able to eat just to be able to buy bread. How hard are you working for faith in your life? I'm going to tell you something. It's easy to preach on faith. It's easy to talk about faith. It's easy to say we have faith. It's even easy to say we have great faith. But I'm going to tell you something. When you get in the darkest time of your life, and you can't find God, and you can't find anyone or anything else, that's when faith gets tested. And that's where you find out what you're really made of. And I've had some issues in my life that have showed me over the years how that I don't have near the faith that I thought I had, and that I don't have near the strength that I thought I have. But God says to us, we got to work at it, and we got to have it, and we got to be willing to, to turn things over to Him. And so there's a duty for bread. It's work, but it's worth it. Amen? Now notice not only the characteristics of bread, but notice the casting of bread. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. What's he mean, cast the bread? Preacher, that sounds pretty crazy to take bread and throw it in water. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about, it was very common in that day, the Egyptians...
started it, and it was carried over into Israel and other places, that around the Nile River, the Jordan River, and other rivers, they would overflow their banks, and then they would go back down. And when they were back down, there would be a mud, there would be a slosh and other things, and, and they would take their seed and they would throw it in that mud area. They would throw it knowing the water was going to come back up over it, and that seed would grow. And then when that water, by the time the water rescinded, that seed would be up what it needed to be, and they could harvest it. And that's the illustration. He said that they have to cast their bread in the water. Notice the place of our casting. Hey, listen, water. You know, I, I got to thinking about water. And when we talk about casting, by the way, did you notice he didn't say cast your seed? He said cast your bread. In other words, when you give something to God and you're going to trust God, you can't see what you're giving him. You have to see the end result. You can't see what you're, what you're providing him or asking him to take. You have to, by faith, see what it's going to be that you're praying for. Where there is no vision, the people perish. When you turn a prayer request over to God and you know it's God's will, uh, listen, you can't just pray, God, give me faith to believe that you're going to do this. you got to believe that he will do it and that you're already looking at the finished product. You say, preacher, that's difficult, I know, but that's what he said. Don't cast your seed, you view it as bread. It's already there. It's already been grown. It's already been harvested. It's already been baked. It's already a loaf of bread. God said when you throw it in, you've got to already believe that that it's going to be the final product. But notice he said, cast it in the water. You know, that's water's unknown. You don't know what's in it. You don't know what it's going to do. You don't know when it's going to rise or when it's going to lower. Water's unpredictable. It can be stormy one day and calm the next. It can be clear one day and cloudy the next. Water is unknown. It's unpredictable. It's unsteady. What do you mean unsteady? You ever tried standing on it? You can't. You can stand in it, but you'll never stand on it unless you're Jesus or Peter. That's the place of our casting. God said, I want you to throw your, your seed, viewing it as bread, in a place that's unknown. Preacher, I could turn this over to God if I just knew how he was going to work it out. You're not going to know how he's going to work it out. you still got to cast it. Preacher, I, I, I know I need to cast it, but it's unpredictable. What if, what if they don't respond the way they're supposed to? God didn't say anything about they or we. He said cast it. you got to cast it in the unknown. you got to cast it in the unpredictable. you got to cast it in the unsteady. God said cast your bread. That's the place. But I want you to notice the problem of our casting. The problem of our casting is we don't want to throw it in the water. See, the problem of our casting is we don't want to have faith when it deals with the unknown. And I'm preaching to myself as much as y'all are. And I'm just telling you, sir, as much as I'm preaching to y'all, God gave me a great victory this morning, and I thank Him for it. And I, again, I thought I had great faith, and I had something I was praying for that I was asking God for, and I've wrestled and I've struggled for several days, and I've fought, and I didn't even realize how bad I was fighting, and I didn't realize how much fear was in my heart. I didn't realize how, how lack of faith I had, and this morning it all come to a head. And God said, you're going to take that situation and you're going to completely and totally put it in my hands. And you know what he said? Cast it in the water. Cast it. In. Yeah, I know it's unstable. I know it's unpredictable. I know you can't, you can't, you can't see how it's going to turn out and what the end result's going to be and what's going to happen. But he said, cast that bread. Don't view it as a seed. You God, my God said, you're going to go back up to your house. I was in my, in my office and he said, you're going to grab your kids and y'all are going to pray and you're not just going to pray that God will do it. You're going to thank me for doing it. You're going to go ahead and view it as bread. You're going to go ahead and view it as a done deal. You're going to go ahead and view it as finished. And I grabbed my family and I got them all together and we, 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 we prayed and we said, God, we're asking you to do this and we're begging you to do this and we're pleading with you to do this.
this and then we said we're thanking you for doing this and we thank you for the end result and we thank you for how you're going to work what is that preacher and I couldn't even remember at that time that this was the next section I had not got to my studying yet and I'm just saying uh, for, for the day and I'm just telling you hey listen that's casting bread but we don't want to cast it in the unstable and in the unsteady and in the unpredictable and the unknown we want to cast the problem is we want to cast it where it's safe we want to cast it where we know what's going to happen we want to cast it where it's seen and we want to cast it for ourselves you know one thing I've learned about my Christian life through this lockdown and this virus and the time I've been able to spend with God is that we as Christians can be very self-centered let me make it more personal I can be very self-centered and I can let self and my will rule me way more than I realized and God said if you're going to cast it see when you cast it you're taking your hands completely off of it you have no control you have no say so you have no promise you have no guarantee you're saying God it's in your hands say preacher that's a scary place to be in it's also a wonderful place to be when you know God said do it because God will never tell you to do nothing that ain't ultimately going to be for your good and his glory so the problem of our casting is that we don't want to do it God's way we want to plant it in the nice ground right out in the backyard where we can see the mound and we can see it grow and we can fertilize it if we need and we can throw extra water if we need to and, and we can make sure that no animals get to it and the seed don't get ate and God said no, 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 no I want you to cast it in the water what do you need to trust God with tonight? what is it that you're scared or fearful of just completely turning over to God and saying God, here it is. Hey, I'm not telling you it's easy. It may be the hardest struggle of your life. But I'm telling you, you'll never get victory. You'll never have peace. And you'll never have satisfaction until you cast bread in the water. Now notice, cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. You know, my problem is sometimes I cast it, but it don't come up fast enough. I cast it, but it ain't working in the time I thought it would work. So in the water I go, wanting to check it, wanting to see it, wanting to make sure it's okay, see what I can do, see how I can help, see how I can fix it. Listen to me tonight. Take it from personal experience. That is not faith. That is manipulation. That is control. That is you trying to do it. That is you trying to help God. And God doesn't need my help. God doesn't want my help. What God wants is for me to trust Him. What God wants is for me to stand back and say, God, I've given it to you. It's in the waters. It's in your hand. And God said, I don't know what that many days means. It may be a day. It may be two days. It may be a week. It may be a month. I don't know what the days are. It may be a year. I'm just saying whatever your issue is, God said, cast it. Put it in the water. And here's God's promise. You don't have to go find it. You don't have to check on it. You don't have to pick it up again. Don't get yourself wet. Don't drown in the water of sorrow and discouragement and disappointment and doubt. By jumping in the waters, you'll choke. You'll drown. God says to us, cast it in the water and leave it alone. Trust me. And after many days... You'll find it. It will come up. Notice its return. It will come up. Notice its reward. It will be bread. And when it comes up, notice verse 2. Give portion to seven and also to eight. For thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. In other words, God said, I'm going to give you enough that's not just going to be enough for you. It's going to be enough for you to spread all around. That give to seven, then to eight doesn't mean that you stop at eight. It just means that you don't stop at seven. You just keep going. You keep going. What is it tonight that you're scared? 
I know God speak, spoke to me through the messages. I know I've needed every one of them tonight. I'm glad I can preach really in a, in a sense of, of accomplishment and the fact that I obeyed God this morning. But I know Sunday's message was for me. And I'm telling you, I know as a pastor and a preacher and a husband and a dad and a Christian, the struggle which is completely letting go of fear. And I found out that one of the biggest reasons that keeps us from trusting God is fear. Let me tell you what fear will do. It'll put you in a hole so deep. Though you know what's right, though you know what needs to happen, though you know you need to do right, though you know you need to get out of it, it'll put you in a hole so deep you won't be able to get out. Fear will paralyze you. Fear will ultimately kill you and destroy you. Fear will mess up everything God has for you. And I'm telling you, when we let go completely... Oh, preacher, I'm not scared. No, no, no. You need to be honest with yourself. If God's not answering, if God's not speaking, if God's not helping, you need to see what part of trust have I not turned loose yet? What part of fear have I not let go yet? God said the comfort of the bread is that he would make sure there's a return and that there's a reward. The characteristics of bread, the casting of bread. But then I want you to notice lastly, the control of our bread. The control of our bread. Look at verse 3 through verse number 6. I think that's right. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. If the tree falleth toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. In other words, you can't control events. If the clouds are full of rain... You ain't stopping them from emptying themselves. If a tree's going to fall, it's going to fall, and you ain't stopping it. In other words, God said, you need to understand something. The reason you've got to cast your bread, and trust me, is because you don't have control of life anyway. But it's amazing how we want to control our life. We want to dictate to God what should happen in our life. We, we would never say that, but that's how we live. We don't live under His Spirit. We don't live in trust. We live in fear. We live in feelings. And we live in flesh. We live in fear because we don't really trust Him. We live in feelings because if we don't feel it, we're not going to do it. And if we live in flesh because we want our way instead of God's way. And I'm saying to you and I, He said in verse 3, You need to understand, you ain't stopping the rain and you ain't stopping a tree from falling in the forest. Now he goes on. In other words, he owns it. Verse 4. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. You know what he's saying there? If you wait for just the right time, the right circumstances, the right situation to obey God and trust God, it'll never happen. He said, He that observeth the wind shall not sow. Well, it's a little windy, a little windy today. I don't think I'm going to throw my seed today. I don't know where it's going to go. God said, if you do that spiritually, you'll never sow. Well, preacher, I'm going to trust God, and I'm going to believe God, and I'm going to obey God. I'm just waiting for it to feel right. It'll never feel right. Obeying God sometimes will never feel right because your flesh ain't going to like it. It's not about my flesh or my will or my way. It's about doing what God said do. And he says to us that if you observe the wind and if you regard the clouds, well, it looks like a little rain. Water might wash out the seed. I better not plant today. God said you'll never sow. He owns the bread. He operates the bread. Look at verse 5. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, the ball, that's the wind, or how the bones do grow in the womb. Hey, you can't explain the wind, and you can't honestly, neither can science explain how bones grow in a baby. Even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. God said, you're acting pretty foolish and pretty prideful to think that you know more than I do. God said, here's my command, cast it and leave it alone. God said, you can't even figure out how the bones grow in a baby in a mother's womb. You can't even figure out. You, you, he said, you, you don't, even, don't even know enough to, to, to know how God works or how the wind works or which way it's coming. Uh, when it starts, God said, you don't know that. And he said, you definitely don't know my work. So why don't you just trust me and cast the bread? 
He owns it. He operates it. May I say he overcomes it. Look at verse 6. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand. For thou knowest not whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. In other words, God said in spite of the wind, that's what, you know wind in the Bible means trouble, circumstances, problems. God said in spite of the troubles you may be facing, in spite of the hesitation you may have, in spite of the issues and circumstances in your life, in spite of the wind, in spite of the rain clouds, in spite of what the weather looks like, God said just get up in the morning, sow your seed, plant your seed. But it ain't seed, it's bread. Plant your bread. Cast it as bread. And God said, here's the thing. You don't know how it's going to turn out. You don't know what I'm going to do with it. So quit being scared. Quit worrying. Quit figuring, acting like you have some control in it. Figuring like you somehow are going to be able to do something about it. And cast your bread upon the waters. And understand, he'll overcome the wind. He'll overcome the rain clouds. He'll overcome everything. Because he already promised in verse number one, if you cast it, you'll find it. So he will overcome. Preacher, but you don't understand. I, I had a big struggle. And I said, Lord, my problem is not my faith in knowing you can do it. I trust you can do anything. My problem is what if the other person don't want it done? What if the other person don't want it? What if they, they're, they're not willing to let it? And God said, Brian, that's lack of faith in me. If I've told you I'm going to do it and I've told you I'm going to take care of it, then you're not, it's not faith or lack of faith in any other person. It's lack of faith in me. And God said, you got to cast it. You got to throw it and you got to understand I can overcome every obstacle to make it work we want to look at a situation yeah God I know you can do it but what about this and what about that and what about this God said cast it it ain't seed it's bread oh I know you're throwing seed but you by faith are already seeing the finished product bread on the table bread in your stomach bread in the oven I want to ask you tonight, are you casting? If you're casting, are you seeing the finished product or are you just seeing seed? Jesus looked at the disciples and apostles and said, Oh, ye of little faith. And I'm afraid he looks at a lot of us Christians and he says, Oh, ye of no faith. God said just a little faith. The faith as a grain of a mustard seed could move a mountain. I'm afraid many times because of the waters, because of the wind, because of the way the clouds look, we look around and say, no, I better not cast it today. No, God said today, cast your bread upon the water. That's the second way he wants us to live. He wants us to be careful about how our attitude is towards our leadership. By the way, it's not just government. That leadership goes to your boss. That goes to your husband, wife. That goes to the pastor of a church. That goes to spiritual leaders over you. That goes to a principal, to teachers. God will never honor our complaining and griping about other people. God said, even if you think it and say it in your bedchamber, you're guilty. God said, here's another way I want you to live. Cast. Trust me. Preacher, our government is not, uh, they're, they're keeping us at home, and what are we going to, whoa, 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 just cast your bread. Preacher, I don't have a job, just cast your bread. Preacher, I'm out of work, cast your, preacher, I, I get it, cast your bread. And then trust. God has never let anybody down, and he's not going to start with you. And if you can believe that, you can see great things from God. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Maybe you need to ask God to help you on the first point and quit complaining and griping about everything and just trust God. Maybe there's some things tonight you need to cast. There's some things that you need to go to God with and say, God, I'm throwing them in the water. I'm not running after them. I'm not putting the diving set on, the scuba mask. God, I'm trusting you. Because you said after many days it'll come back. And God, regardless of how the wind looks and regardless of how the, 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 the water looks and regardless of how the way the clouds look, God, I'm trusting you. We sing about trust, trust and obey, for there's no other way. We sing the choir song, I can come trust Jesus, and we talk about that. But if we want to be real brutally honest with ourselves, most Christians never have much faith at all. We live in fear. We live by our feelings live in the flesh I don't know about you but I want to see the crop 
I want to see the harvest of a life lived by casting bread in the water. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I hope the Lord will speak to your heart as he spoke to mine. Father, I love you tonight. And God, in Jesus' name, right now, I ask of you to deal with all of us. God, I'm sure somewhere in this message, someone needs to repent of something, be convicted of something, get right over something. So I pray you help us tonight. And God, I ask of you to use the message in a mighty way. I thank you, God, that you've helped me live this this week. Lord, I'm just amazed at your timing of messages. And God, if my personal battles and experiences help our church, then I'm more than willing to share them. God, we want to make our faith about someone else or something else, and it's not. Our faith is in you and about you and what you'll do, irregardless of what anyone else does or don't do. So God, I, I, I ask again forgiveness for lack of faith and distrust and God, all those things that I was battling with you over. And I'm thankful tonight, God, that there is victory when we just cast it in the water. Guide, direct, and help us, Lord. Please move upon us, bless our church, and in these days, help us to live the way Solomon said. Help the wisest man in the world, you said. He said, quit complaining. And he said, start casting. Lord, I pray you help us. We'll look at the next one next week. Until then, Lord, I pray that you keep us safe, watch over our church, and give our people faith. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. I pray that you'll join us Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, Sunday night, 6 o'clock. And then also, don't forget, are you? Recovery program, 7 o'clock Friday evening. Excited about what God's doing there. Let's continue to pray for one another. God bless you. You have a good evening.